So I'd like to um, thank Ulrich Pagel for the um, introduction and chairing this talk. And I would like to also thank Vincent Tournier um, for inviting me here to speak at SOAS for the Buddhist Forum. It's a great honor um, uh, to be part of uh, this vaunted uh, series. This evening, I'll speak about a previous birth, or what I'm calling rebirth narratives, in Buddhist texts and art of Gandhara and the northwestern borderlands of South Asia, which is uh, displayed here on the map. Um, Gandhara uh, can be contextualized within a larger frame of uh, the Indo-Iranian frontiers between the Indian subcontinent and the Iranian plateau. Um, I'd like to refer uh, to a recent, a con recent workshop on the geography of Gandharan art at Oxford's uh, Classical Art Research Center last month, where the discussion of what is meant by Gandhara proper, uh, greater Gandhara, and connections with neighboring regions, uh, such as uh, Taxila and the Punjab um, across the Indus River, the Swat Valley, uh, the Upper Indus region, which I'll be discussing in the seminar on Saturday, as well as areas um, uh, across the Hindu Kush in ancient Bactria were, uh, were discussed extensively. And I think those talks are available now on a podcast um, at, on the uh, Classical Art Research Center's uh, website. The study of Buddhist narratives, which is my proper topic uh, today, in literary and visual cultures has generated a considerable interest uh, due to uh, the great treasuries of stories across Buddhist traditions. The depths and broad extent of the ocean of Buddhist stories continue to be navigated, although scholars entering the waters of this ocean sometimes risk danger of drowning or shipwreck, like the merchant sailors in a famous episode of the Simhala Sartavaha Avadana. Um, these, um, uh, this uh, uh, story was the focus of a storytelling uh, event which was organized at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto after the last um, International Association of Buddhist Studies uh, conferences there. Rafts for crossing these potentially, these potentially turbulent waters are supplied by recent work on Pali and Sanskrit texts, including uh, translations published by Naomi Appleton and Sarah Shaw, Alice Collette, um, and Andy Rotman, uh, with scholars such as uh, John Strong, Reiko Onuma, and many others providing the kind of navigational tools for interpretation of the literary depths. Works by uh, Todd Lewis on noir versions of Buddhist narratives, such as uh, the version you see depicted here in this noir scroll, and, by, um, a a and, and also by contributors to a recent volume edited by Stephen Collins on readings of the Vesantara Jataka, demonstrate that many of these stories are still very much alive in contemporary Buddhist cultures. Ties between rebirth narratives, epigraphy, and art are evident very early at Barhut um, uh, with 2nd and 1st uh, century BC Brahmi inscriptions uh, with labels of Jatakas, and also in recently published materials from a Satavahana Buddhist shrine at Kanaganahali in Karnataka, which uh, Christian Lutzanitz has uh, made available um, uh, with excellent images on his website. Dieter Schlingloff's detailed studies of narrative wall paintings at Ajanta, as well as important contributions by Vidya de Hegia and Maurizio Tadei, help to understand various modes and styles of narration in Indian Buddhist art. Alfred Fouché, who was called the grandfather of Gandharan studies um, by Zv Vladimir Zwolf in his catalog of the Gandhara sculpture in the British Museum, also had a keen interest in Buddhist jatakas in text and art throughout his long career as an art historian in the first half of the 20th century. Fouché and other scholars interested in Gandharan Buddhist visual, culture, visual, visual cultures um, and iconography, as well as um, the archaeologists who's, who explored the material culture of many excavated um, sites in Gandhara 
in northwestern Pakistan and, and, and Afghanistan, relied uh, primarily on Pali and Sanskrit texts for literary frameworks to guide their interpretations of the narrative imagery and uh, materials from the archaeological excavations. Now, as many of you know, Gandharan art uh, tends to emphasize the present life story of Shakyamuni Buddha, but in this presentation, I'll discuss an important exception um, to that generalization uh, by focusing on an encounter with the previous Dipankara in a past life story. Since Fouché's time, uh, discoveries of early Buddhist manuscripts from Gandhara written in the Gandhari language, that is uh, what Harold Bailey uh, called the Northwest Prakrit vernacular, which uh, is almost exclusively written in the Kuroshti script and uh, used in inscriptions, uh, coin legends, and administrative documents from Nia and other sites in the Taran Basin, have opened um, new access to the regional literary culture in periods overlapping with the peak phases of Gandharan artistic production in the first few centuries CE. Okay, so before the British Library uh, acquired a collection of uh, 29 birch bark scrolls um, in the mid-1990s, only a single incomplete scroll of a Gandhari version of the Dharmapada from Khotan, uh, which was uh, discovered in 1892 and definitively edited by John Bruff in 1962, uh, provided evidence for a suspected corpus of Gandharan Buddhist literature. This um, emerging corpus of Gandharan Buddhist texts has become greatly enlarged within the last 25 years, um, with additional collections uh, listed here uh, becoming available for scholarly study. And here I'd like to refer to a recent book uh, published by my um, former supervisor, Richard Solomon, at the University of Washington on the Buddhist literature of ancient Gandhara, an introduction with selected translations, which just appeared from Wisdom Press uh, last month. Um, in that book, um, he gives samples of the various uh, contents and genres attested in Gandhari manuscripts. Uh, these um, texts within the Gandhari manuscripts exhibit various levels of originality, um, innovation, um, or fidelity to Indian Buddhist parallels, and many of them lack uh, direct literary parallels in Sanskrit, uh, Pali, and other Buddhist languages. In this presentation, I'm focusing uh, particularly um, on genres of uh, rebirth narratives, and here I'm using the term uh, rebirth narratives in a uh, qualified sense, uh, um, uh, that are labeled as avadanas and purva yogas um, in the British Library uh, uh, collection. Okay. Um, well, these two genres of avadanas and uh, purva yogas were uh, written by two scribal storytellers um, who composed um, original summaries of around 57 um, uh, avadanas and porviyogas. So these summary stories, um, in many ways, just preserve the basic, the basic details um, with uh, terse explanations uh, of the names, the um, uh, titles, and the, and the place where the story, uh, where the story happens. Uh, their um, handwriting, um, can be um, distinguished uh, from the handwriting of the primary texts of the British Library Scrolls. So the primary text in this case uh, was written by a scribe in using a thicker hand and uh, was um, um, basically four Ekotarikagama type sutras uh, which uh, have uh, which were edited by Mark Allen, who is a previous speaker in the series this year. And you can see here, um, at a certain point, a scribe writing in a larger flowing hand uh, takes over and begins to write these summary stories of Avadanas in the leftover space on the bottom of the scroll, on the recto, and then flips the scroll over and continues to write on the verso. So these Avadanas scavenge space at a uh, scavenge leftover space on these scrolls um, after the primary text had been written. 
Um, as Timothy Lenz has observed in his editions of Purva Yogas and Avadanas, published in the Gandharan Buddhist text series, stories of linkages to previous births, um, that is to say, the uh, uh, Purva Yogas, explicitly connect the past and present lives of the figures, while the Avadanas uh, tend to focus only on the present lives, uh, without necessarily a reference uh, to a past life. And there are only a few exceptions in which the avadanas are karmic tales with explanations of how current conditions resulted from past actions. So ripening of karma is not the overriding theme or concern of the vast majority of the avadana narratives, which, as Lenz has pointed out, do not conform to what he calls the standard avadana package. That is to say, other Buddhist literary compilations of both Avadanas and Jatakas, uh, Jataka birth stories. Okay. So there's a lot of overlap uh, between these genre terms. Um, and one point I'd like to make is that this term uh, Purva Yoga, as, as Tim Lenz has pointed out, is not exclusive to the British Library Gandhari manuscripts. Um, and uh, the other main point I'd like to uh, emphasize again is that the Avadana stories in these manuscripts, in contrast um, to the Avadanas in Sanskrit literature that many of you are familiar with, as well as the Jatakas, uh, tend not to be concerned with karma vipaka uh, from a story of the past, the Atitavastu in Sanskrit. And uh, so, in other words, they, uh, they represent probably an early phase of the narrative development of these genres, uh, which are differentiated uh, very er in these uh, manuscripts, which belong to a time with a terminus postquem in the first century uh, CE. So many of these summary stories do not have direct literary parallels. Unlike most of the primary texts um, in the British Library collection, except for uh, commentaries and scholastic literature, which like the Avadanas and Poor Vyogas, do not have the direct literary correspondences. Um, and they only include the skeletal information with formulae calling for the rest of the story to be expanded in detail. This uh, formulae for expansion uh, reflects connections between the written summaries and processes probably of oral expansion in the storytelling tradition. Stories about well-known characters from the time of the historical Buddha or Ashoka tend to be uh, more identifiable with other versions in Buddhist literature that have been imported or transplanted from the Buddhist heartland in ancient Magadha and uh, Kosala. On the other hand, Gandhari, Avadanas, and Purviyogas localized in the Northwestern geographical, political, and cultural context represent what might be called a homegrown strand of regionally distinctive narratives. These homegrown Avadanas and Purviyogas, uh, belonging to first century Gandharan contexts, are more difficult to link with previously known narratives, but display a great regional diversity of the early Buddhist storytelling tradition. So to give an example, um, I'll briefly discuss uh, uh, this story with references to the four uh, Mahashavakas, are the four Mahashavakas. Um, and this story is the eighth Avadana in a series of nine stories uh, written uh, that started on the bottom of the recto of uh, uh, the text with the four Ekotarigagama type sutras as the primary text, and then continues uh, to the bottom, to, to, to the end of the verso, to a point where you can see that it becomes very fragmentary, uh, especially towards the um, uh, right margin of the text. Okay, so um, the reconstruction of the recto by Mark Allen. Um, in his edition in the Gandharan Buddhist text series, allows us to ascertain the placement of these fragments on the verso. A significant amount of writing has been lost, as you can see here, particularly uh, towards the bottom of the scroll, and many points in the interpretation remain uncertain. So I'm just presenting it here in case you're able to help me out a little bit with some ideas. But I think also I'm presenting it because I want to give you some ideas of the, some idea of the challenge uh, that's involved in interpreting uh, these very fragmentary, terse, original stories. 
Now, in this uh, story, which uh, uh, I've uh, given to you here in a kind of tentative, in-progress uh, translation, we can see that there's a reference to uh, the name of Ajata Shatru. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that's clearly preserved in the introductory formula and indicates that this avadana is set in ancient Magadha, either during or shortly after the time of the historical Buddha. Now, what's interesting about this story is that an enigmatic character named Yola Arutaga is introduced sh just after the name of uh, Ajata Shatru, and that's what's highlighted here in this box. Um, so this name, uh, Yola Arutaga, is um, uh, probably of Iranian uh, derivation and suggests local innovation and deliberate anachronism in the composition of the narrative perhaps in an effort to link uh, Shaka figures with Ajata Shatru and the four Mahashravakas, who are listed uh, towards the bottom of the scroll as uh, um, uh, Shariputra, uh, with Moggallana uh, kind of supplied, um, Mahakashapa, and uh, Aniruddha, okay, right before the formula for the, for the expansion of the story. Okay, so point I'd like you to take away here is that scribes and artisans employed uh, different strategies to localize, incorporate, and appropriate uh, diverse regional characters, groups, and settings. These summaries suggest a pattern in which uh, local and regional associations with contemporary first century figures and settings um, in the milieu of the northwestern borderlands are lost or diminish in the course of narrative transmission as doctrinal themes gain greater emphasis. This is a point that I presented at the last uh, IABS meeting in uh, Toronto. These uh, story summaries written by uh, uh, scribal specialists belong to a stage of development when genre distinctions and characteristic structures were still very much in flux. The fragmentary condition of the, frag, uh, of the birch bark materials and the difficulty of identifying even partial uh, literary parallels or versions makes interpreting the content of many stories, many of these stories, an ongoing challenge, as you can see here. So in order to develop um, a better understanding of the broad range of uh, previous birth stories that were circulating um, not only in Gandharan literary contexts, but also um, in visual me media in the early centuries of the Common Era, uh, I coordinated a, a collaborative research project, which uh, Ulrich referred to as in, it, in his introduction. And uh, this uh, project was a collaboration with uh, Timothy Lenz, um, who I've been uh, co-editing um, the remaining stories in the British Library uh, collection with over the last many years, um, and also an uh, art historian uh, at, affiliated with the Royal Ontario Museum named David Jongavord. Um, this project on Buddhist rebirth narratives in literary and visual cultures of Gandhara uh, was funded uh, by the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation for Buddhist Studies through the American Council of Learned Societies. And this funding supported a global survey of Gandharan Jataka images in museums, archives, and other collections, which uh, David Jongavord supervised. Um, we found uh, in this survey over 170 images of identifiable Jatakas in Gandharan art. Um, I've given you a uh, list of around 14 or 15 of those stories. The list sometimes uh, changes. But one thing to understand about the list is that this repertoire is dominated uh, by, um, by, by, by images of the Dipankara, uh, Dip, of, the Dip, of Dipankara's encounter uh, with the Bodhisattva, uh, which I'm going to be uh, talking about shortly. But before um, uh, talking about that uh, major episode, which dominates the repertoire with between 100 20 and 130 images out of the 170 uh, we were able to find, I'd like to just point out that um, we were able to make a couple of new identifications. Uh, those new identifications are highlighted here as the Nalapana uh, Jataka, uh, are, uh, it's the story in which the leader of the monkeys brings his troop uh, down to a well and notices that there are footprints all around the well and bones and so he tells the other monkeys not to go down and drink out of the well 
with their mouths, but to use straws. And that's what's depicted here, uh, and because the well is inhabited by a rakshasa. Um, we also know this story from Kanaganahali, uh, from Kizil, in, uh, outside of Kucha in Central Asia. Um, but the Gandharan depiction is uh, a, a bit different because instead of looking as, as if from above at Kanaganahali and at Kizil, it's, uh, it, the, the, the viewer sees the scene horizontally. Um, another story uh, is that of the um, Naga, or the young elephant, who is raised by an ascetic, but then as the elephant grows up, he uh, comes back to destroy the ascetic's hut. And uh, that uh, we were able to find in a couple of different um, Gandharan images, including this one from the uh, archives of the Museum Nacional uh, uh, Orientale in, in Rome. Okay, so the point I'd like to emphasize is that um, from this survey of Jataka's, or so-called Jataka's identified in Gandharan art, uh, we have a unique situation where we have not only very early texts, um, but also images of overlapping genres of rebirth stories from one cultural region, from Gandhara, um, from around uh, the first century to uh, third or so century CE, uh, when these Gandharan images uh, are, are, or Gandharan sculptures um, were, were produced. So, the other point I'd like to emphasize is that uh, our project um, really adopted a holistic approach um, for a comprehensive understanding of narrative transmission in written and visual media of Gandhara. Now, this approach um, is necessary because when we compare uh, this list of uh, previous birth narratives in Gandharan art, with the Avadanas and Purviyogas summarized in Gandhari manuscripts, only one of these stories, that is to say the well-known story of Vishvantara, um, or in Pali Vesantara, is summarized in a Gandhari series of Purviyogas, um, uh, edited, by, edited and translated by uh, Timothy Lenz here. And so you have some of the uh, images uh, from the Peshawar Museum of the, uh, of the Gandharan um, uh, sculptures. Um, and then you have the uh, literary version, um, which again gives you an example of kind of the very terse nature of these Avadana and Purviyoga summaries. Okay, um, so this point of overlap, of singular overlap, demonstrates the need to utilize various types of sources to clarify which, sort, which stories were drawn from a larger pool of orally transmitted stories in Gandhara. Okay. Um, so it's also uh, necessary um, or helpful, I would say, to incorporate the outside testimony of Chinese uh, pilgrims accounts from a somewhat later period after the fifth century. Uh, these uh, records of Chinese visitors uh, to Gandhara and the Northwest testify to patterns of distribution and localization of rebirth narratives in the ritual landscapes of Gandhara and the Northwest, which came to be regarded as a second holy land, as Fouché terms it. Um, Koichi Shinohara uh, developed a typology for translocating narratives of uh, previous Buddhas and, uh, and births of the of the Bodhisattva in Gandhara in order to construct sacred places outside the greater Magadan homeland of Shakyamuni. Um, and this is part of a threefold typology along with narratives about conversions of autochthonous um, Naga and Yaksha deities and also um, w narratives about um, movable objects used by the Buddha, uh, such as the uh, contact relic, his uh, Paribhogika Datu, of the begging bowl, which was Koichi Shinohara's specific focus on this uh, article on the story of the be Buddha's begging bowl, imagining biography and sacred places. Okay. So what I'd like to do now today, um, in the time that I have remaining, is to take stock of the significance of previous birth stories by offering hypotheses about the selective emphasis and elaboration in Gandharan written and visual media. And I'll be making three points. Um, the first uh, 
point, or the first hypothesis, is that macrohistorical narratives proposing karmic links between past and present births of the Buddha in place where the Buddha was previously born, seen, and heard in the terrain of Gandhara and, the, and neighboring regions. Thus, uh, rebirth narratives integrate Northwestern regional places and figures, including uh, contemporary first century uh, fit characters in Gandhari, Avadanas, and Purviyogas, into the life stories and genealogies of the Buddha and previous uh, 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 Buddhas. The second point I'd like to make is that narrative models shaped and contributed to the development of Buddhist religious aspirational and devotional practices, including making vows, uh, pranidhanas, uh, to realize goals of Buddhahood by embarking on the bodhisattva path. These stories uh, certainly also um, encourage ethical action, um, such as uh, provide, by providing an impetus for patrons to make donations, but the use of narratives as didactic tools to promote the material interest of the monastic community to lay audiences uh, was only part of their uh, function. The third point I'll make um, is that rebirth narratives, as, as well as other narrative genres, embedded or localized, um, uh, uh, which were embedded or localized at regional shrines, facilitated Buddhist transmission beyond the northwestern borderlands. If aspirations to embark on uh, the path of becoming the Buddha could be realized there, in this frontier region of the Northwest, it could happen anywhere, even much further away from Shakyamuni's homeland beyond the frontiers of South Asia. So I'll be applying these three hypotheses to two major examples, uh, the examples of the Sudashna story, which is the um, uh, version of the Bodhisattva's name in the Gandhari Purva Yoga, as well as uh, to Dipankara's encounter uh, with figures uh, named as Mega um, in, the Mahavast in the Mahavastu's Dipankara Vastu, uh, Sumati in the Divya Avadana, in, in the Dharmaruchi uh, Avadana, um, and uh, as uh, Sumedha in the Pali uh, Nidanakata. Okay. So first, though, before coming back to the Sudashna uh, Purva Yoga, um, I'll talk about the Dipankara episode. Okay. Um, so this story is one in which um, a young ascetic um, encountered the uh, previous Buddha Dipankara. Um, by, and when he encountered the previous Buddha Dipankara, he made offerings of uh, flowers, of uh, padmas, which he attained from a kind of a flower girl, um, and then bowed down um, and, uh, so that the Buddha Dipankara did not have to walk through the mud that was created by a te tempest. Um, and so this, um, a big part of this story is that um, at this point, um, the young ascetic, um, Mega or Sumati or Pali Sumedha, makes a vow, a pranidhana, uh, to become uh, a Buddha. And then that's paired with a prediction, a vyakarana, uh, by the Buddha Dipankara, that that will, in fact, um, happen over the course of, uh, uh, of, of many births. So what's uh, particular about this uh, Dipankara, the story of encounter with the previous Buddha Dipankara, um, is that uh, we do not find it summarized in extant Gandhari, Avadanas, and Purva Yogas, at least in the British Library collection, despite its dominance of the um, visual repertoire of uh, Gandharan rebirth narratives. However, um, Dipankara is listed as the first uh, of the previous Buddhas in a Gandhari version of the Bahu Buddha Sutra um, in a scroll in the U.S. Library, Library of Congress, Congress uh, being edited by Richard Solomon. Now, uh, Vincent uh, Tournier has drawn attention uh, to this Gandhari version as the earliest of uh, earliest evidence extant evidence of the uh, kind of sub-classification of Bahu Buddha Sutras incorporated into the Mahavastu and other Buddhist texts. Um, the episode of the Bodhisattva encountering uh, Dipankara, um, although not included in the Pali Jataka collection, that's to say it's in the Nidana Kata um, instead, 
um, can be considered a, a rebirth narrative in the broad sense, although it's not technically a jataka, according to the Pali classification, and scholars like Dieter Schlingloff uh, do not classify it as a, uh, uh, really classify it more with the life story of Shakyamuni Buddha, um, so, that it, um, uh, so that the term dipankara jataka tends to be restricted to the conventions of Gandharan art history uh, more than anything else. Now, in um, Gandharan art, the encounter with Dipankara very often prefaces the events of Shakyamuni's present life story, making its uh, position in the iconographic program of Gandharan stupas quite extraordinary. So, in other words, uh, even though you can't see it here, when you do look at uh, stupas with many different life events depicted around the drum, oftentimes it, the, that series starts with Dipankara's encounter, or the encounter with Dipankara, um, like you see here in these images uh, from the British Museum right next door. So depending on how the narrative scenes in False Gables are counted, the Dipankara encounter is among uh, the top five narratives in Gandharan art. Um, just after uh, the birth, uh, the departure, and the, uh, and, and the Mahapari Nirvana of uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni. So it easily exceeds um, the number of depictions of other pivotal events, including the awakening under the Bodhi tree at Bodhgaya and the first teaching in the Deer Park at Sarnath, as well as other pivotal events in Shakyamuni's hagiography. So in terms of my first point about um, how the Dipankara episode uh, relates to macro-historical macro connections between the Buddhas and present lives, it's clear that the genealogy of previous Buddhas and the extended life story uh, of the Bodhisattva essentially begins with this encounter uh, with Dipankara, which is localized by uh, Chinese pilgrims, uh, including Fa Shen in the early fifth century, um, in Nagarahara. Nagarahara, as you can see from the map, is uh, located in the Kabul River Valley, uh, uh, just upstream uh, from, uh, fr fr from uh, pra Gandhara proper, um, and uh, on the way to on the, on the way to the Hindu Kush passes um, uh, that you see here on the map. Okay, now. Um, the second point about uh, what the what Dipankara's prediction of future Buddhahood uh, contributes to the development of Buddhist practice, we can uh, I would I would I would follow uh, Vincent Tournier in pointing out that uh, Mega's aspirational vow, uh, his pranidhana, and Dipankara's uh, Vyakarana, his prediction, sets the pattern for aspiring to Buddhahood in the uh, in the kind of interlinked biographies of other previous Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Um, finally, um, why is embedding or emplacing the encounter with Dipankara important for the transmission of Buddhism beyond Gandhara? Um, I would say that um, this uh, 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 localization of Megha's uh, meeting with Dipankara and aspiring to Buddhahood, uh, which um, uh, might be considered within a range of Buddhological developments in the early century CE related to the generation of the thought of awakening uh, necessary for pursuing the Bodhisattva path in a uh, Gandharan environment uh, demonstrates that one can set forth on this path anywhere. Um, that undertaking this vow does not necessarily entail meeting the historical Buddha Shakyamuni in the heartland of ancient Magadha. Since the genealogy of previous Buddhas in past era, er, er, eras was expanded and, incorporate, and incorporated uh, the future Buddha Maitreya, uh, the franchise for making Pranidhana vows uh, to aspire to Buddhahood is consequently also expanded backwards and forwards in time and outwards from Shakyamuni Buddha's homeland in ancient Magadha and Kosala. Okay. So, as I've already noted, um, the uh, story of uh, the prince who gives everything away, uh, known in the Gandhari Purva Yoga summary as Sudashna, in Sanskrit as Vishvantara, and in Pali as Vaisantara, is the only story summarized in the 
BL Gandhari series of Purvi Yogas and also depicted in Gandharan art. So here I've shown images uh, in the British Museum uh, from the site of uh, Jamal Gadhi um, in, um, in, in, in the Peshawar Basin. Okay. Um, now here I should uh, qualify that it's the second story um, in the series of Purvi Yogas edited by Lenz, uh, but it's not explicitly labeled as a Purvi Yoga. Um, and the protagonist's name, uh, Sudashna, or Sudasha, with a kind of diacritic over the top of the retroflex sha, which would correspond to retroflex n, like in terms of when we transcribe the word Vish, the name Vishnu, it's with a similar character. Um, it doesn't correspond um, to uh, the Pali or Sanskrit forms of Vishvantara or Vesantara. Um, so as discussed by Lenz, the difference in the name, uh, Sudasha, uh, aligns the Gandhari summary more closely with Sogdian and other Central Asian versions, as well as with the Chinese transcriptions of the character's name in earlier uh, translations, um, thus serving um, as a key piece of uh, mounting evidence uh, to confirm the Gandhari hypothesis that Gandhari was the language of the, the underlying language of the initial phases of Chinese translation. So the sequences of the uh, Vishwantara or Sudeshna story in Gandharan sculptures from Jamal Garhi and uh, perhaps also from um, uh, Sherhi Balul in the Peshawar Museum place uh, this narrative a very distant second um, along with sculptures of the Shyama Jataka uh, after the Deepankara episode in Gandharan art. So according to our uh, survey of uh, Gandharan Jatakas, both the um, Sudeshna, um story of giving everything away, including the royal elephant, uh, the children, uh, uh, the chariot, and even his wife, as well as the Shyama Jataka, which I'll discuss very briefly, are um, both have about 10 or 12 different images. Whereas if we compare that to the Dipankara story with over 120, it's, uh, they, they, it's very small. Um, uh, they're not represented quite as well. So in terms of uh, asking questions about how the Sudeshna story fits into um, uh, a kind of macro historical perception of karmic links between the Buddha's past and present lives. In the well known Pali Jataka collection, Vesantara is the Bodhisattva's penultimate birth before Siddhartha, um, as elaborated in the final and longest Jataka in the Mahanapata of the uh, Theravada or Mahavihara tradition. Um, it's still the most widely known narrative in Southeast Asia. Um, and while it's not possible to extrapolate from the Pali collection or from contemporary Southeast Asia to Gandhara, this story may have served as a bookend, as suggested by Lenz, um, to the Deepankara episode as a conclusion to the extended uh, uh, previous birth stories before Shakyamuni. Now, as far as what the, Deepankar, what the Sudeshna story contributes to the development of Buddhist aspirational and uh, devotional practices in Gandhara, um, it is the uh, paramount example of selfless donation, but limiting uh, its interpretation to a functional expl explanation of ethical principles is um, insufficient. If it is a uh, literary, a Buddhist literary and visual epic, as proposed by uh, Richard Gombrich and Margaret Cohn in their translation of the Pali version, which is depicted and labeled in multiple panels at Kanagana Hali and in expanded visual formats at Sanchi and Ajanta, it's not so surprising to find uh, the narrative in Gandharan media. According to uh, Chinese accounts, but not of Fa Xian, but of later Chinese visitors, uh, this narrative is also localized in, um, it, at shrines around Palu Sha, which uh, remains kind of uncertain as to its exact location. Um, Elizabeth Arrington proposed locating it around Sherry Balol, but Fouché and others who follow him have instead uh, proposed to identify the events in the story with landscape features around Shabas Garhi, where we find a set of ma Ashokan major rock edicts uh, at the foot of the Karamar Spur of Hills. Now, why is um, Im embedding the uh, story of the prince who gives everything away um, important for transmission within and beyond Gandhara? So, Consolidation of, uh, the, uh, uh, of Buddhist sacred geography uh, in Gandhara between the visits of Fa Xian and Xuanzang 
overlaps uh, with the growth of monasteries and shrines um, in the Peshawar Basin. The localization of famous episodes of this narrative attracted local and long distance pilgrims, just as episodes associated with the exiles of the epic heroes of the Ramayana and Mahabharata stimulated the growth of Hindu pilgrimage to regions beyond the Ganga Yamuna Doab in northern India. Um, Gandharan Buddhists were not the only ones to play this game as uh, Fouché and Lamotte dismissed the process of uh, generating sacred geography. Um, but their agency in claiming their own place as a home for the Buddha's previous births was obviously successful and did not prevent other regions beyond South Asia from staking their own claims. Okay, so um, since my um, uh, time is short, I'm going to jump to my conclusions instead of talking about the Shyama and Ekashrinka Jatakas, which were also located in kind of the ritualized topography of the mountain passes separating the Peshawar Basin from the Swat Valley. Um, and for discussions of the Shibi Jataka um, and also the Viagri Jataka, which are not only depicted in fragments of Gandharan art, uh, but also in petroglyphs from the upper Indus region at sites like Sh Chalas Bridge and Shatial, uh, you'll have to come to the seminar on Saturday. Okay, so in terms of giving some conclusions uh, to my talk, um, I'd like to review the hypotheses about selective emphases and elaboration of previous birth narratives in Gandharan texts, uh, images, and landscapes. The integration of Buddhist macrohistorical paths into Gandharan and adjacent regional contexts was a way to domesticate uh, rebirth narratives by making homes or dwellings for previous Buddhas uh, and previous births as the Bodhisattva uh, in settings in the nor northwestern borderlands. So here I'm drawing upon this model of uh, literary domestication of Avadanas and Jatakas proposed by Todd Lewis uh, for, the, for, for Noir Buddhists in the Kathmandu Valley and I'm also drawing upon this idea of uh, a theory of religion developed by Thomas Tweed, uh, which he called crossing and dwelling, in which there's basically an impetus um, to situate um, religions in both time and place, um, and also for religions to move beyond their original times and places uh, to other regions. The second hypothesis um, about <coughs> rebirth narratives as models of and for uh, Buddhist religious practices of aspiration and devotion, um, those, um, that kind of hypothesis is most strongly supported by Megas or Sumatis or Sumedas encounter with the previous Buddha Dipankara and also by the Sudeshna Purva Yoga. Um, Secondary story compilations of Gandhari Avadanas and Purva Yogas belong to a transition from oral storytelling uh, to formalization of standard Avadana packages, when perhaps these um, uh, doctrinal um, emphases were not quite so clearly pronounced. The placement of Jataka sequences in Gandharan sculptures on staircases uh, to paths for circumambulating stupas along the Pradakshinapata can be related to the idea of realizing aspirations of the bodhisattva career through a series of births by taking steps on the path uh, to, these, uh, to that kind of aspirational level. Embedding or emplacement of rebirth narratives in Gandharan landscapes facilitated Buddhist mobility and transmission in multiple directions. The localization of these stories um, crisscrossed between ancient Magadha and Gandhara uh, between Gandhara and Bactria along Fouché's Viol route, and between Gandhara, Taxilaswat, Central Asia, and China, just like the two-way uh, traffic of missionaries from the Northwest and Chinese pilgrims who followed the routes where many of these episodes from these stories were commemorated. Thank you. <laughs>